chapter 3 and verse 19. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. Title of the message this morning, glory in this, glory in this. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Pray that you would bless now as we look at your word, that you would speak to hearts, you'd work in lives. Lord, I pray for those here this morning that have never been born again the Bible way. I pray that they would understand their desperate need of salvation. Lord, to acknowledge you not just as the creator of this world and of this universe, but as the savior of mankind, of those that will come and place their trust in you. Bless now in this service we ask in Jesus' name, amen. We've looked thus far in our series at birds and bugs, and today we will look at outer space. Once again, it is not difficult to see the hand of a creator God when you look at this area. I want us to consider three things this morning, and they all start with D, dimensions, design, and decision. First of all, the dimensions you should know. The size and the scope of the universe is staggering. Just what we know, and there is a lot that we do not know. We just don't know how much we don't know. With just what we know, it is almost unbelievable. You can only try to comprehend the vastness of the universe through feeble analogies. Suppose you could go a thousand miles for a penny. You could go a thousand miles for a penny, then a trip around the world would cost you a quarter. You could go a thousand miles for a penny, then a trip to the moon would cost you two dollars and forty cents. A trip to the sun would cost you nine hundred and thirty dollars. A trip to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star system, would cost you two hundred and sixty million dollars. You could go a 1,000 miles for a penny. You wanted to make a scale model of our corner of the universe, you could put a tiny speck to represent the earth on any given spot, and just five-eighths of an inch away, place another tiny speck to represent the moon, and just 19 feet away, place a little ball to represent the sun. Then to represent the nearest star, you need to place a ball 1,000 miles away. Distances in space are so vast that they are measured in light years. 186,000 miles per second. Almost 6 trillion miles a year. And that's so fast that a bullet shot at that speed and traveling around the earth, if it were possible to do so, would hit you 15 times before you fell to the earth, even if it took, slightly, took you slightly less than 2 seconds to fall. 186,000 miles per second. It would take you only about one and a third seconds to reach the moon at that speed. And if it takes one and a third seconds to go to the moon at the speed of light, how long would it take you to cross the Milky Way galaxy, just one galaxy? How long would it take to get across? It would take approximately 120,000 years. The speed of light. They now tell us that our galaxy alone may contain more than 400 billion stars. And they estimate that there are more than 100 billion galaxies. And yet distances in space are so vast that they tell us that sometimes the distance between one star and the next is more than 40,000 light years. That's how vast space is. Think of that, perhaps more than 400 billion stars in our galaxy and more than 100 billion galaxies. There are perhaps 400 billion billion stars that we know of or or that we can guess are there, and yet space is so expansive that it can be said to be almost empty despite 400 billion billion stars. The average star, according to astronomers, radiates energy at a rate of 521 sextillion horsepower. A sextillion is a one followed by 21 zeros. All of that energy from all of those stars 
In the 1940s, an eminent uh, astronomer wrote, the hypothesis of simultaneous creation will not stand up under serious criticism. But now even unsaved scientists concede that the evidence points towards simultaneous creation. Hugh Ross, an astronomer and author, says that astronomers who do not believe in God are becoming rarer. Outer space is mind-boggling. The sun is actually a star, or the stars are actually suns, depending on how you want to look at it. Consider the size of the sun, just one sun, our sun. It is 860,000 miles across, over 100 times as wide as the earth. If the sun were hollow, almost one million earths would fit inside. The sun is actually a comparatively small star. We have a star in our galaxy, Antares, which is 150 million miles across. By the way, they have calculated that the sun is shrinking at a rate of at least one and a half kilometers a year, almost a little less than a mile a year, and that's the most conservative calculations. If that shrinkage has been constant, then the solar system cannot be billions of years old, as the evolutionists claim. One million years ago, the sun would have been twice its diameter. 210 million years ago, the sun would have been touching the surface of the earth. And that's only one of scores of evidences for a young earth and solar system in contradiction to the evolutionist guesses, and we don't have time to get into that this morning. But the more that we learn, the more we discover, the more we find out that we don't really know very much. And a lot of what scientists think they do know is wrong and constantly changing In the 17th century, the telescope was invented. Before that, Hipparchus said that there were 1,022 stars. Ptolemy said that there are actually 1,056. Kepler said there are really only 1,055. These were astronomers. And Jeremiah, centuries before, said that there were too many to count, that they were innumerable. And once again, the Bible is proved to be right. No legitimate scientific discovery has ever contradicted the Bible. And plenty of scientific discoveries have contradicted the science textbooks. The Bible is timeless and always right. In Jeremiah 33, 22, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured. You couldn't possibly count the number of grains of sand on all the beaches of the world, and you cannot possibly count the number of stars there are. The Bible says the stars cannot be numbered. And God was talking to Abraham. He said, then blessing, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. You won't even be able to count your descendants. The Bible states clearly and repeatedly that God made everything. Isaiah 44, 24, thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, I am the Lord that maketh all things that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, and that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish. Isaiah 42, 5, Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spread forth the earth, and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walk therein. It is God that has done that. You say, outer space is big. Yeah, God stretched it out, the Bible says. Isaiah 40, 18, to whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? Verse 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. The inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heaven as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Verse 25, to whom then will you liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Verse 26, lift up your eyes on high. And behold, who hath created these things that bringeth out their host by number? He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Now I well understand that there are some people who take issue with that. They believe that they are wise when they come up with their theories that exclude God. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men. 
And sometimes people get intimidated by scientists with all their big words and with their titles and all of their degrees. Listen, if they don't believe in God, they're not wise, they're fools. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 3, Yea, also when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he is a fool. Stephen Hawking is regarded as one of the most brilliant men around today. But God says that he's a fool. Here's from his book, A Brief History of Time, From the Big Bang to Black Holes. He says, At the Big Bang itself, the universe is thought to have had zero size and so to have been infinitely hot. But as the universe expanded, the temperature of the radiation decreased. One second after the Big Bang, it would have fallen to about 10,000 million degrees. This is about 1,000 times the temperature at the center of the sun. About 100 seconds after the Big Bang, the temperature would have fallen to 1,000 million degrees, the temperature inside the hottest stars. We're therefore fairly confident that we have the right picture, at least back to about one second after the Big Bang. Now, there are some people that think, well, you know, he must know. He's got the degrees, and, and he talks about a lot of things that, that I don't understand. Actually, he's completely wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, if you don't have a problem with those quotes, see if you do with this one. If the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, the universe would have recollapsed before it ever reached its present size. Now, I suppose there are plenty of people who think, wow, he must be really brilliant to know all of that. No, no, not at all. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And some people's eyes glaze over and their brains seize up when you start talking about numbers, especially really big numbers. So let's break this down and make it a little bit more understandable. The number we are talking about is 100 quadrillion or 100,000 trillion. That's about what our national debt will be by the end of December. <laughs> I'm just kidding. 100 quadrillion is a one with 17 zeros after it. Now, if you were to illustrate one part per million, you could do it this way. One part per million is one drop of water in 14 gallons of water. One part per billion is one drop of water in 14,000 gallons. One part per trillion is 10 drops of water in enough water to fill the rose bowl. One part per quadrillion is one drop of water in the amount of water it would take to fill 100 rose bowls. That's one part per quadrillion. One drop of water in the amount of water it would take to fill 100 rose bowls. So there's a, that's a total of 100 rose bowls. One part per 100,000 million million is one drop of water in the amount of water it would take to fill 10,000 rose bowls. We're talking about a lot of water. One drop more or one drop less could not even be measured and would not make any difference no matter what you are considering. But Stephen Hawking wants you to believe that if the rate of expansion one second after the Big Bang had been smaller by even one part in a hundred thousand million million, the universe would have recollapsed before it ever reached its present size. People say, well, he must be brilliant. No, he's foolish. Now, if you're still okay with that last quote, here's another quote for you. He says, there are some solutions of the equations of general relativity in which it is possible for our astronaut to see a naked singularity. And then Hawking defines a singularity as a point in space-time at which the space-time curvature becomes infinite. A naked singularity is one that is not surrounded by a black hole. He says the astronaut may be able to avoid hitting the singularity and instead fall through a wormhole and come out in another region of the universe. This would offer great possibilities for travel in space and time. 
Now I realize you may not have majored in science and you may not be that much that, that interested in science and so I don't want you to get lost in this quote but I want to give you the context and I want you to catch the final part of it. We'll emphasize it because I, I want you to see the point he's trying to make. He says, unfortunately it seems that these solutions may all be highly unstable. The least disturbance, such as the presence of an astronaut, may change them so the astronaut could not see the singularity until he hit it and his time came to an end. In other words, the singularity would always lie in his future and never in his past. The strong version of the cosmic censorship hypothesis states that in a realistic solution, the singularities would always lie either entirely in the future, like the singularities of gravitational collapse, or entirely in the past, like the Big Bang, it is greatly to be hoped that some version of the censorship hypothesis holds because close to naked singularities, it may be possible to travel into the past. While this would be fine for writers of science fiction, it would mean that no one's life would ever be safe. Someone might go into the past and kill your father or mother before you were conceived. As if you didn't have enough already to worry about. Now someone may go back in time and kill your parents before you were ever conceived. Which, in case you haven't figured it out yet, doesn't bode well for you. Here's some more from Hawking. When one looks at real time, there's a very big difference between the forward and backward directions, as we all know. Where does this difference between the past and the future come from? Why do we remember the past but not the future? I don't know. That's a tough one. He says, in a sense, the gravitational field has negative energy. In the case of a universe that is approximately uniform in space, one can show that this negative gravitational energy exactly cancels the positive energy represented by the matter. So the total energy of the universe is zero. No wonder you are tired all the time and there are days you can't seem to get anything done. He says, now twice zero is also zero. Thus, the universe can double the amount of positive matter energy and also double the negative gravitational energy without violation of the conservation of energy. So it doesn't look like things will be getting better anytime soon. Now these are the men that say there is no God. People say, well, you know, they must know. They're brilliant. They have all these brilliant ideas. No, they're fools. And God says they're fools because they rule out God. They come up with all sorts of nonsense. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish. And that's exactly what God does. Again, Hawking says, in the, if the universe is indeed spatially infinite, or if there are infinitely many universes, there would probably be some large region somewhere that started out in a smooth and uniform manner. It is a bit like the well-known horde of monkeys hammering away on typewriters. Most of what they write will be garbage, but very occasionally, by pure chance, they will type out one of Shakespeare's sonnets. Similarly, in the case of the universe, could it be that we are living in a region that just happens by chance? To be smooth and uniform? Is that why our universe is so con conducive to life? No, here's a better explanation. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. As to his illustration of the monkeys, he's wrong there too. Mathematically, that's demonstrably uh, wrong. What he said was incorrect, but we'll have to look at that another day. We don't have time now, but suffer through, if you will. One final quote from Hawking. This is for those of you who are thinking, man, what he writes is crazy. Because theories are always being changed to account for new observations. They are never properly digested or simplified so that ordinary people can understand them. That's why you can't figure out what he's saying this morning. You have to be a specialist. And even then, you can only hope to have a proper grasp of a small proportion of the scientific theories. Further, the rate of progress is so rapid that what one learns at school or university is always a bit out of date. So even if you're educated, it doesn't help you any. Only a few people can keep up with the rapidly advancing frontier of knowledge, and they have to devote their whole time to it and specialize in a small area. The rest of the population has little idea of the advances that are being made or the excitement they are generating. Of course, you can appreciate the excitement that will be generated once people find out that eventually someone may be able to go back into the past and kill off their parents before they were even conceived. We spent some time on that this morning because I wanted to show you some of the people that position themselves as wise. 
These are the people that tell you there is no God, that we all just evolved. And the Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The Bible says that the evidence for God can be clearly seen because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Bible says if you would just look around without your biases and prejudices, the evidence for God, for a creator of this universe, is overwhelming. Indeed, when we look at the dimensions of space, they are overwhelming. God stretched them out, the Bible says. If we possess an atlas of our galaxy that devoted but a single page to each star in the Milky Way, that atlas would run to about 40 million volumes of 10,000 pages each. It would take a library much larger than the size of Harvard's library to house the atlas and merely to flip through it at the rate of a page a second would require over 40,000 years. And there are 100 billion more galaxies. If the earth were the size of a grape, if you could shrink the earth down to the size of a grape, proportionately then, how big would the Milky Way be if it was reduced to a proportionate size? You could shrink the earth all the way down to the size of a grape. How big would the Milky Way alone, just the Milky Way be? It would still be 55 billion miles wide. The universe is filled with other galaxies. Who can imagine the size of the universe? We've looked briefly at the dimensions of space. We literally have just looked at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Space is overwhelmingly vast. But I want us to consider also the design of space this morning. Number two, the design. It's incredible to contemplate the size of space, but what about the design? The sun, moon, stars, planets just randomly flung out in space, or is there design and order and structure? You know, scientists have listed uh, scores of different factors that must exist for life to be possible. There are dozens and dozens of areas that must have values falling within narrowly defined ranges concerning the universe in general and our galaxy, our sun, the moon, and stars, and all of that in particular for life to be possible. Do you think it's all just accidental, happen chance, coincidence? We, we got lucky here. The mathematical odds against that are greater than we can conceive. The number would be higher than any number we could calculate this morning. These parameters, by the way, have been discovered by many astronomers and physicists and scientists. They've been scientifically evaluated by the secular world and verified by unsaved scientists. Uh, These are not something, numbers that some uh, Christian invented to show an all-wise creator. This list of parameters and boundaries is constantly growing. They had two parameters that they knew about in 1966 concerning our galaxy. They had eight by 1969. They had 23 by 1979. They had 30 by 1989. Now there are over 150 narrowly defined measures in which our, our solar system, our universe, must, our, our, our particular part of the universe, our galaxy must fall. More being discovered every year. Many of the items on the list are too technical for this morning's message. would take much too, uh, way too much time. But just looking at a few of these areas this morning should be enough to show any objective person that this world that we live in has been fine-tuned to the nth degree just right for life to exist. Biochemists tell us that uh, for life molecules to operate so that organisms can live, it, require, it requires an environment where liquid water is stable. This means the planet Earth cannot be too close to its star. It cannot be too far away from it. In the case of planet Earth, a change in distance, they tell us, from the sun as small as 2% would rid the planet of all life. The Earth's biosphere is perfectly poised between a runaway freeze-up and a runaway evaporation. If the mean temperature of the Earth's surface cools by even a few degrees, more snow and ice will form, and and snow and ice reflect solar energy much more readily uh, than any other surface materials, and thus the reflection of more energy would translate into even lower temperatures, which would result in more snow and ice, and so on, which would result eventually in a complete freeze. 
On the other hand, if the mean temperature of the Earth's surface were to warm up just a few degrees, more water and water vapor and carbon dioxide would collect in the atmosphere. And the extra water vapor and carbon dioxide would create a better greenhouse effect in the atmosphere. And this, in turn, would cause the surface temperature to rise again, resulting in more vapor and carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere and on and on. And you don't need to fear those things. God has made the earth just right. The Bible says, while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. God did all that and balanced it out. If you're not saved this morning... The only global warming you need to fear is the day of the Lord when the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth will be burned up. 2 Peter 3.10, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. There will be a global warming coming one day and it's going to be very warm, but it's not from using styrofoam or anything like that. If you're saved, you won't be here. Rotation, a rotation period of a life-supporting planet also must fall within narrow boundaries. If a planet takes too long to rotate, the temperature differences between day and night will be too great. Oftentimes, on many planets, hundreds of degrees difference between day and night. If a planet rotates too rapidly, the wind velocities will rise to catastrophic levels. For example, Jupiter only takes 10, 10 hours to rotate, but they tell us a quiet day on Jupiter generates 1,000 mile-per-hour winds. It takes 12 years to orbit the sun. Pluto takes 248 years to orbit the sun. If the Earth's crust were just 10 feet thicker than it is, that much additional matter would have oxidized. They tell us all the free oxygen out of the air. If the crust were too thin, then volcanic and te tectonic activity would be too great. Our Earth moves around the sun in a fixed, established elliptical orbit. If our Earth were to slow down, we would be pulled too close to at the shallow part of that orbit and burned to a crisp. If we sped up appreciably, it would throw us so far into space at the long end of that orbit that we would freeze to death in the far reaches of space. The moon is about 240,000 miles from the earth. The moon governs the tides. They tell us had the moon been placed only 50,000 miles from the earth and the resulting tidal waves would go over the top of the Rocky Mountains. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, is a spiral galaxy. Only 5% of the known galaxies are spirals. The other 95% are elliptical or irregular. In irregular galaxies, there are still active nuclei that spew out life-destroying radiation and material. We now know that most galaxies are not the right kind to support life in any way. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars searching for intelligent life in outer space. Every discovery has indicated that the search is almost certainly in vain. Former Senator William Proxmire said we would be far wiser having spent those hundreds of millions of dollars searching for intelligent life in Washington, D.C. The temperature of a planet and its surface gravity determines what's called the escape velocity, a measure of which atmospheric gases dissipate to outer space, which ones go and which ones are retained. For a planet to support life, it is essential for water vapor, molecular weight of 18 to be retained while molecules as heavy as methane, molecular weight of 16, and ammonia, molecular weight of 17, dissipate. That's exactly where the gradients fall. A change in surface gravity and temperature of just a few percent will make the difference. There's not much margin for error. Again, we're perfectly positioned within narrow parameters. There's so many areas we could look at. They tell us if there were more than one star in our planetary system, if there were two suns we orbited, life on earth would be impossible. If the sun were redder or bluer in color than it is, photosynthetic response would be insufficient to sustain life. If our axial tilt were greater or less, life would be impossible. If our magnetic field were stronger, life could not exist. If it were weaker, life could not exist. Our oxygen to, uh, to nitrogen ratio in the atmosphere has to be just right. So many areas we could look at, oxygen quantity, oceans to continents ratio, soil mineralization, and on and on and on. In addition to these areas that we know about, scientists are currently studying about a dozen other parameters in order to establish which boundaries are necessary for life on Earth to be possible. Areas such as atmospheric transparency, mantle and core constituency, temperature gradient, pressure, all of that all fall within narrow, uh, necessary boundaries. 
It is entirely possible before they are done, they will have discovered well over 250 different parameters in a number of different areas within which the earth and the moon and the sun and our solar system must fall and remain for life to be sustained. Many of these parameters have no give or leeway in them at all. For many of some of them, the rate of variance possible is measured in fractions of 1%. In some of them, it's as small as one one one-thousandth of 1% that the earth must fall within those narrow boundaries. And yet somehow, some way, the earth and the sun and the moon, the planets fell just right for every one of those parameters. Listen, those parameters weren't thought up by some preacher. Secular scientists have discovered them and teach them. In addition to all of that, there's a remarkable balance of living things. For example, if birds did not eat insects, keeping their population in check, then insects would proliferate and decimate the world's vegetation. As we mentioned previously, you can start with just a pair of flies. If they're allowed to breed unrestrained and they have no natural predators and they're allowed to just breed prolifically with no birds or anything else to kill them off and they just die of old age, they tell us that within six months, the surface of the earth would be 50 feet deep in flies. And yet birds supposedly didn't evolve until many millions of years after insects. That's what evolutionists say. Fred Hoyle is a scientist who has written extensively against Christianity. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, he discovered an incredible fine-tuning of the nuclear ground state energies for helium, beryllium, carbon, and oxygen, that that was necessary for any kind of life to exist. His conclusion was that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology. Some kind of super intellect must have put this together. Scientist Paul Davies has gone from promoting atheism to stating that the laws of physics seem themselves to be the product of exceedingly ingenious design. He goes on to say, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. Astronomer George Greenstein wrote, As we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency, or rather capital A agency, must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? Tony Rothman, a a theoretical physicist, wrote, When confronted with the order and beauty of the universe and the strange coincidences of nature, it's very tempting to take the leap of faith from science into religion. I am sure many physicists want to. Arno Penzias, who won a Nobel Prize in physics, remarked, Astronomy leads us to a unique event. A universe which was created out of nothing, one with a very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Cosmologist Edward Harrison said, there is, here is the cosmological proof of the existence of God, the design argument of Paley, updated and refurbished. The fine-tuning of the universe provides prima facie evidence of deistic design. It would appear that there's A God out there that did this. Take your choice. Blind chance that requires multitudes of universes or design that requires only one. Many scientists, when they admit their views, incline toward the design argument. Alan Sandage, astronomer, said, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There has to be some organizing principle. God, to me, is a mystery. But the explanation for the miracle of existence, why there is something instead of nothing. Robert Griffiths, mathematical physicist, said this, if we need an atheist for a debate, I go to the philosophy department. The physics department isn't much use. Meaning, of course, that the men in that department are becoming increasingly convinced of the existence of God. Astrophysicist Robert Jastrow is an agnostic. His observation is perhaps the most telling of all. He says, for the scientist who has lived by, the, by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. 
He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. We've looked at the dimensions, we've looked at the design, and now we come to our final point, the decision. The decision. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Psalm 102, 25, Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Nehemiah 9, 6, Thou, even thou, art o Lord alone, thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. Proverbs 3.19, the word Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens. Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. And day unto day utter his speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The psalmist in Psalm 8 said, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? The decision, the decision is yours. The decision is up to you. What are you going to do with God. What are you going to do with God? And David was so overwhelmed with this God who is so majestic and powerful to create what we've talked about this morning. Overwhelmed that he would even care to contemplate man. When I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars, and we don't know how much David knew, but we know an awful lot today about it compared to probably what he knew back then. Outer space is mind-boggling. God, who is man that you'd consider us? God does consider us. He cares about us. He cares about you. What are you going to do with that this morning? Become religious? That's not what God wants. God wants your heart. He wants a relationship with you. The creator of the entire universe wants a relationship with you. He created you for his fellowship and for his glory. He wants to have a relationship with you. And then, Christian, how about you? Perhaps what we've looked at this morning should change your values and your priorities. In Jeremiah 9, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. IQ of 150, so what? Bench press 350 pounds, who cares? Millionaire by the age of 40, big deal. The Bible says there are those who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed for every man. They worship and serve the creature. They worship and serve what God has created rather than the creator. And we can get more excited about LeBron James's basketball abilities than a God who made this universe. LeBron James has a vertical leap of 44 inches. Some people are really impressed with that. They get really excited about that. But you know what LeBron James or Peyton Manning or Albert Pujols can do is nothing, nothing. LeBron James is just a speck on the Miami Heat team, and the Miami Heat are a speck in the city of Miami. Miami is just a speck in North America. North America is just a speck on our planet, and our Earth is just a speck in the solar system. Our sun and planets are just a speck in the Milky Way. The Milky Way is just a speck in the universe. Oh, he can jump perhaps 10% higher than the average NBA player, Big deal, big deal. He can score more and rebound better. Big deal, big deal. He's just a speck on 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 a speck in the universe. I know the one who made the universe. And you can too this morning. 
the one who created it all. He designed light to travel at 186,000 miles per second. He made a universe so big you cannot possibly comprehend it. You can't possibly wrap your mind around it this morning. And then he came to this world that he created. And he died for you. And died for me. He was in the world. The world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Came into his own. His own creation. His own people. His own received him not. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. Oh, if you'll come to him and place your trust in him, not in yourself, your religion, your church membership, the fact you try to keep the sacraments or you've been baptized or catechized or confirmed, what good does that do? He wants your heart. He wants you to turn from your sin and turn to him. Acknowledge him as the creator of this world, creator of you. Acknowledge him as your Savior, if you'll call upon him for that this morning. Oh, surely I ought to worship him. It is a fool that has said there is no God. The Lord, the creator of the world, came down to walk on this planet that he made. He became a carpenter, perhaps the greatest paradox of all time, the one who just spoke the world into existence. All those planets and those stars we've talked about this morning, the great dimension of space, he spoke it all into existence and stretched it out. The Bible says he humbled himself and clothed himself with human flesh and became a carpenter where all day long it would, he'd work just to make a table or a little chair, a little stool, all day long. And yet he had just spoken the universe into existence. He humbled himself and limited himself. And when he got from place to place, he walked or rode a donkey. And he got tired and thirsty and hungry. All of those things. He clothed himself with human flesh to live in this world. And at the age of 33, be crucified by the religious crowd. It wasn't a good plan gone bad. It wasn't an accident. No, before they ever crucified him, he said, no man taketh my life from me. I lay it down. I lay it down. Why did he do that? For you, for me. Because we, his creation, rebelled against him. We went our own way. Our sin problem this morning is that we've gone our own way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ came down and took your sin and my sin and died on the cross of Calvary to pay our sin debt to redeem our souls and buy us back to God. But you've got to accept it. You've got to make that choice. You have a decision this morning. Oh, not to join some church, not to become religious. What will you do with God? Father, I pray that you'd bless this invitation time now. Pray that you'd work in hearts and lives this morning. In Jesus' precious name, amen.